Okay, I think we will make a start. Uh, welcome everyone. We've got a good number of people on. Um, this is the this is the Open Data Saves Lives uh, webinar series. <clears throat> the background for those newbies is we myself and Paul set this up during COVID, and it was it was kind of an attempt at the time to very very rapidly bring data together uh, around COVID that we we thought was perhaps happening a little bit slowly um, at the centre. So um, in, a, in a slightly disruptive way, we we just sort of scaled the country for people who'd who'd built some really in, interesting data sets and applications uh, around COVID, uh, with a whole range of them. Um, the the model here is that all of them are published on the internet, <clears throat> so they're not behind any sort of firewall or um, or secret members club that you need to be a part of. <clears throat> and we encourage people to come and and sort of share it. Don't think of it just as kind of open source. That's been around for a long time. This is what we're kind of terming open innovation. So just trying to to get people to share quickly. Um, COVID was very helpful. We had a thing in the NHS called a copy notice and that allowed us to um, get on with things and not get too stuck in information governance as quickly as we used to. Um, and that helped surface a lot of data um, at pace and, and it's brought together a, a quite a helpful uh, collaboration of people, many who are on here now. Um, we've got funding over the last year or so to put this program together and to keep it going. Um, we've run a couple of unconferences, as we call them, just because of this sort of online nature of it. Um, we ran one earlier this year. We've got another one planned later this year, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about at the end. But the focus there is on inequalities, which is a really key thing in the NHS at the moment. For, for those of you from the NHS, there's a, there's a whole kind of policy area uh, called Core 20 plus 5. <clears throat> so the 20% the of the population that are most deprived. Uh, plus five key areas and those are things like maternity so we've done a lot of work on continuity of care uh, mental health in there I see we've got Nigel on from the, the mental health trust um, and there are some very specialized areas around heart disease and, and diabetes and other areas as well so so inequalities is a big focus for us um, it's actually part of the national planning guidance now um, and the NHS is going to have to more uh, more regularly and at a, at a finer level of detail, have to describe how it's offering its services fairly and equitably. Um, that inequalities work, which we'll do in detail, probably probably in September as people come back from the August break, links directly to these two applications we've got today. <clears throat> so we're very lucky to have Peter and David with us. Peter's going to give some reflections on how uh, we, he stood up um, sort of modelling and monitoring and forecasting of COVID at pace uh, during COVID, which we're still doing now. So Peter provides me a, uh, a very regular Omicron forecast, which goes through to next winter for us now, which is re really, really uh, helpful for us. Uh, and David um, is going to talk to us about some education data. And, and that links again to some of the issues that we've seen during COVID. <clears throat> we had a session uh, a year or so ago on domestic abuse, and we, we were able to make the case to link police data to NHS data. Um, from conversations that David and I and others have had, there is huge potential around data captured around um, pay, uh, uh, students um, and how they feel about um, school and, and how things are going and so on. And we really want to explore if it's possible to triangulate what people in the NHS would describe as wider determinants of health. So it's all very well having good data about the hospitals that you really need data on the wider determinants of health. What's your school life like? What's your home life like? What type of house do you live in? What's the air quality like? Um, have there been any issues with the police and, and so on? So we're, we're trying to couch these events so that they all link together very neatly. Um, you'll, you'll be the judge of how that goes. Um, so Peter, I'm going to hand over to you first of all. We've got about 20 minutes or so. Um, I'll then bring David in. And myself and Paul will try and sort of marshal questions as we go. So the floor's yours and the, the screen's yours as well. Great, thanks. I think Taz is going to be in control, I think. So for a slide, it worked 10 minutes ago. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm Peter Lacey. Uh, I'm Director of Health Systems Partnership, which is a small consultancy doing quite a bit of demand and capacity modelling. Um, and we are... Um, I suppose experts in the field around system dynamics and the relationship between system dynamics modeling and data, uh, which would become apparent, uh, is, is where I want to focus, but then lead on into um, 
a, a cunning plan um, to sort of um, meld the world of system dynamics with the world of data. So um, it's the sort of title, it was a working title. Next slide. Um, I want to be controversial with, with, with my net, with a statement at the top of, the, uh, of this slide. Modeling your data, the emphasis being on modeling your data for purposes of forecasting, exploring future demand class, is just about as useful as telling someone to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. I hope that's modestly sort of controversial. So I will explain myself. Um, so I've been um, in the NHS for just over 30 years. I was employed for eight years before I went into consultancy. I was never, uh, I'm not an information specialist or a data analyst or a um, computer sort of programming geek, but I uh, respect and engage and, and link with all of those people. And I'm probably what you just describe as highly numerate rather than um, sort of intensely data driven. Um, and I mean, that sort of um, what is data 30 years ago, data information intelligence, it was all the rage, it probably still is. Um, but the fact that we now talk about um, being a data driven health and care system um, sort of raises concerns for me. Um, and, and that's part of the sort of issue in terms of being so um, endowed with huge number and huge amounts of data um, growing uh, at exponential rates, but sometimes getting lost um, wood for the trees type syndrome. Um, now, that's not an anti-data statement. It's a case of uh, how do we use, and this is where the examples uh, I'll use, and I suppose the, the harnessing of data rather than the um, being led by the nose uh, of data. So that's my proposition. Uh, and there's another little sort of, uh, if you click it on again, I've just got put a statement at the bottom because it's sort of, it's the system stupid um, rather than the data. So whenever I see um, politicians or, or others saying we're data driven or even um, some of the experience in COVID where we had to wait for data before it was, for, for several weeks after it was blindingly obvious that uh, action needed to be taken, um, data can be a constraint. So, that's my little sort of controversial start of the 10. Next slide. System dynamics, uh, if you're not familiar, probably most of you are vaguely, sort of either vaguely or, or more uh, aware. Stock and flow um, generated in proprietary software or increasingly in, um, in open source software, though with challenges in that area, and we'll come back to that later, um, is, is, is a modeling approach that starts with the system, not with the data. One of the two or three mantras that we start with if we're training folk um, and pitfalls that people fall into when they come to us and say, what this data, can you model it using system dynamics? Um, is that if that, that the model is not, sorry, the data is not where you start. The data needs to inform your understanding of a system. And I'll hopefully demonstrate that um, through these short slides. Um, and primarily because we would be extremely, despite the, the, the amount of data we've got, we would still be extremely restricted um, on, on the intelligence that we can drive out of our analysts if we rely just on the data sets that are designed actually for other purposes. They might be designed for performance management, that may be relevant. They might be designed for financial management. They might be designed to answer ministers' questions. Um, and all of those are not necessarily the inf information that you would use um, to manage in a complex environment um, the transformation of services that's, that's the sort of behest of most managers. Um, so an example, um, there's, a, um, there's a, a, a comment, there's a next slide that will um, uh, uh, elicit this, um, but the, yeah, make it up experiment, explore the system. So a couple of months ago, um, the health secretary got up and said, um, we now, we've got an electric recovery plan. And I sat down um, and in two or three hours, constructed a system map and a model without any data um, that reflected the behavior that was being described in the minister's statements in terms of it's gonna take a long time, it's gonna go up before it comes down, there's a virtual backlog and we don't know how much of it is gonna come back. There was an awful lot of statements of uncertainty within the minister's statement. Um, and yet what's happening now is that we're all working hard on demand and capacity plans to, uh, to, to work through um, recovery. And if you go to the next slide, this was the product 
Um, this is a stock and flow model. I've sort of split it in two because it was too wide. You don't have to read the, the individual words. Um, there's a blog there if you want to read more. Um, but this model, albeit with the experience that I have in building models, but I don't think it's rocket science, um, to, to build a, a representation of a recovery system. And what you've got here um, is, is a flow across the system from presenting need, the impact of COVID, through to waiting lists and recovery in terms of uh, activity and waiting list. And you'll see within the stocks there a little bit of the behavior and the feedback and the likes. And this um, we published online, uh, wrote a short blog. Um, but the key thing here is that this was generated with, a, with notional numbers, but then defined what data would be useful to collect to consistently um, to, to build, if, if you like, a parallel universe within which we can understand the recovery that we're seeking to attain. Um, it didn't start with the data, but it's essential if, the, if this model were to go forward for a range of purposes um, to then start to specify data. And if the data isn't there, um, to either find it, triangulate it, um, or to be creative uh, in order to get a proper representation of the system. So that's what one example from from recent mark, um, mark mentioned covid so the next slide um, is a further illustration of how the, the relationship between the data and the systems modeling can be a very harmonious and rich one um, the picture there hasn't come out terribly clearly on the bottom which is unfortunate so i'll tell you what's missing in a moment because there are actually blue bars underneath that green line um, that, that represent the actual data that we had supplied to us um, twice, we twice weekly um, for the last two years that enabled us to compare the model outputs with the actual data. So in our COVID modeling, it was uh, driven, driven by a, a standard epidemiological approach. It translated that on the basis of risk and intelligence and the emerging evidence to the risk of hospitalization. It then generated an expected level of both admissions and bed occupancy. But we never used the data for admissions and bed occupancy to seed the model. We used it to compare the model and then to uh, explore the assumptions and triangulate the assumptions around the model to fit with the actual data. And it was a constant learning process. It was also a process in which data quality and data consistency were highlighted and smoothed out. I can't say in record time because I'm not, it's not my day-to-day -day business, but I was um, pleasantly surprised by the fact that when we were working across 20 systems and we identified one or two systems where the model wasn't behaving in the way that the data suggested, that the issue lay in the quality or the nature or the consistency of, of, of data recording. And that really helped those local systems to improve their data quality. So there's a positive feedback there in terms of data quality, consistency, and therefore the ability to share across different systems. I put there, there were up to 18 different hospital systems uh, across the southeast of England. We used the same model um, in half a dozen other locations other than the southeast. Uh, and it was a really good example of how, uh, how data could be used to inform the building of a model um, that was actually a, a reflection of the system rather than just starting uh, starting with the data. So that's the COVID um, case study. Um, the next slide. Really just to ask the question, um, how can we harness this? How can we move on from this? Um, I focused, as, as is our core trade in system dynamics, it's a pretty neat way to support a learning approach to complex changes. Uh, and, and we need data, good quality, consistent data, often linked data um, to enable that to happen. But there have been significant barriers over the decades um, to its widespread adoption. We've uh, given that thought, wouldn't bore you with it now, um, but any number of reasons, one of which um, is, is relates to the open innovations, open source uh, sort of sharing type of approach. Um, a business model such as ours limits the spread and adoption because we're a small but for-profit company. Academic routes um, have not proven to be nimble afoot enough. Um, and the system itself um, is, is trying hard, but very pressurized in terms of its the demands on data analysts and the likes. Um, so what we've come up with, um, our cunning plan, 
um, is, is really useful models. Um, we, we've established it as a not-for-profit. There's a blog, there's another blog there, this time on the Open Data Saves Lives that was put up uh, back in January. So if you haven't read that, go to that. It explains a little bit more. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is in the same spirit as um, Open Data Saves Lives, to generate both a conversation, a movement, and, um, and engagement in, in linking the skills required in, in systems modeling to the data sources, um, as well as combining system dynamics modeling under the bonnet, if you like, of some of our traditional data visualization and, I suppose, regression-driven um, forecasts uh, rooted in the data. So there's a, there's a cunning plan afoot. The next slide. This is our first attempt at a, a sort of a, a branding and a description. This was produced as a, as a leaflet and shared at a recent event. Um, there's there isn't there's a, a website in development, but there's nothing um, sort of on the surface yet to share. Um, but it just goes through the challenges, why we need something like really useful models, what it will do, um, and it's, uh, I've described that already um, in, a, in a very sort of open, innovative way. Um, and you've got the mug shots there, um, two of whom are on this call. Um, I don't think the other three are, but they're all thumbs up in the background. So we've got five, uh, five directors just starting to work through how we develop Project RUM, how we work with um, ODSL, and how we work with others as well um, in the service and, and elsewhere. The penultimate slide was just then sort of uh, changing the style, um, thinking through and putting out there, I suppose, challenges, complex challenges need tools that handle the comp complexity in a transparent way. Um, not for profit, exploring and learning, we're, we're exploring that with um, Python and R. Um, we're working how system dynamics model, and we've got a, a, a client project at the moment around workforce planning. Um, where we're embedding a system dynamics um, simulator online, but building a Power BI interface, linking it all with Azure, um, and, and it's, it's almost working. Um, so there are ways of really harnessing um, system dynamics, but there are also ways in the project that I've just mentioned um, of, of really benefiting from an open approach to sharing data, and in that case with the workforce uh, it was an information agreement with Skills for Care. It was it's in the social care environment um, where data was shaped. We didn't have access and didn't need access um, to the line by line data, but we shared with having built the model, we shared with Skills for Care, who were the data owner, um, a shaping process that then enabled a consistent and repeatable set of data that then feeds the model in the sort of environment that I've described. And I think that's, whilst I've described it, rather than showing it to you, that's the sort of ambition that we have within really useful models. So uh, we're hoping that uh, the last slide, you and others, um, will hopefully come on the journey with us. Um, that's my really useful models email. Um, and we have been having discussions with Paul and Taz um, about how they can help us just on the first stage of the journey. and. Uh, happy to take any questions. I can see there has been chat going on, um, but uh, having yeah. been, not, not being distracted by it, I'll, uh, I'll maybe let. Yeah, that's all right. I can, I can try and frame those for you, Peter. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, th yeah, the chat's quite busy. I think one of the suggestions we made in there um, was, you know, with their partners, such as those on here, like the Health Foundation, that could probably um, socialise this. Um, Peter asked about HDI UK as well. Um, and I, I think I'd, I'd be interested in your view of how we can use those bodies, but, but also just sort of more widely your reflections on the structure of the market. I mean, I think what you're suggesting is there, there was a market that, exist, that existed and still exists of sort of traditional consultancy where people are trying to create IP, <clears throat> you know, and develop commercial models around that. <clears throat> and I wondered what your reflections were on whether we can break that down based on what we've done during covid because what you're proposing is a slightly, is a very different model it's not for profit but it, it it's not without cost with there's, there's absolutely cost in there because someone needs to you know pay you or or, or whomever but we, what we're suggesting is that the the costs are directed to collaborating and building the models as opposed to yeah. some sort of hidden ip which 
you know develops a kind of value of its own which we don't really need and i just wonder what your i know you have a, a vested interest in this but i just i wonder what your reflection well, i'm trying to divulge my vested interest in it in, the, in effect um sort of or disperse yeah. it um so <clears throat> the larger consultancies have toyed with um building and developing capacity and system dynamics modeling um and never quite cracked it um i think they've got a vested interest in in, in retaining a model of, of yes, in effect, hidden IP. Um, and um, I have on occasion um, sort of mopped up um, situations where the transparency of models left by big consultancies leaves the client scratching their head. And whilst we can't unravel it, we can produce something that's a bit more transparent. And I think that's just reflects the ethos and values that we've tried to um, uh, have uh, over our over our time in consultancy, um, the so the market. I'm, I'm not sure the a market is the right description. I, I think this is uh, this is embedding a set of skills, um, and top down is not very helpful. Um, tends to become over -pro programmatic. So it's it's basically if it's useful, it will grow. And at the moment, there have been barriers in, in recognizing and using um, this sort of approach that we want to sort of remove. Um, that's probably not a very sort of um, structured response, but. No, that's right. I mean, the, the follow up from me would be, I wonder what your reflections are on the, what is the right level? What is the level that you think this works best at? So for example, you and I are collaborating in Kent and I have a regional role for Kent and Medway, so that's, four providers, a range of mental health providers, community trusts, and, and so on. Um, I get invited onto quite a lot of calls across Kent, Surrey, Sussex, um, you know, and we've got ICSs within that. And I just wondered what, but, but we're also, I mean, I was at a strategy workshop yesterday and we're talking about, we'll buy things once where it makes sense, but we'll absolutely empower PCNs and local HCPs to do a lot of their own work they'll design their own interventions that we will yep. centrally provide them with a way of this is how you build a, a model this is how you do an evaluation you know and we'll give them the core set of skills but we absolutely won't prescribe how each of them is done and I wondered the thing that I'm interested in as you know about is is how you use your diagram of the stocks and flows to have a, a grown-up conversation with decision makers not just analysts and I just wonder at what level you think you can use that to engage them. Can it, can it be very local or does it have to stay quite regional? So in terms of, the, I think there's a regional role in supporting the development of the skills right the way across from analysts through to decision makers. And we always, we, we often describe the, the, the issue of um, people not asking the right question or not asking the question the right way that enables um, analysts to explore and sometimes wanting such quick answers that the engagement necessary um, isn't possible. Um, I think the, the 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 current sort of move towards uh, ICS and uh, sort of more integrated um, sort of um, intelligence functions could be something that we can build on. Um, I think when we lost uh, a lot of the IT, this is the early noughties with um, um, CSUs in the health service. Um, we, we, we sort of lost some of that creativity potential um, and, and there wasn't enough capability and capacity at PCG and then PCN level to really have the luxury to do this sort of stuff. Um, whereas if you've got an ICS with, a, with a, some way of virtually integrating the intelligence functions, then you've got uh, an environment in which hopefully this type of approach can flourish. Um, and that I think is a, is a key sort of target area. Um, yeah, no, I, I'd agree. I'd agree. Um, Paul, you've got a question. Yeah, I'll just um, ask uh, Peter just to consider this. Um, when we're dealing with um, lots of people in health and we talk about open and sharing and, and moving at pace, and it's basically what you're talking about, how can we do things quicker, faster, more effectively? Um, the immediate question comes, oh, we haven't got time to do this. Oh, we're not able to do this, or who's going to pay? Mm. Um, could you give us some bullets to fire um, to respond to um, those sort of uh, th th those considerations when people give us the reasons not to do this? There's there's a sort of um, 
there's a threshold that you get need to get to. Um, so pushing a, a, a boulder up, up a hill or whatever. I've, I've shown you um, today, albeit with my level of experience, a model that was useful, um, developed in three hours, reflecting on um, a, a minister's speech. And, you know, you can sit in any boardroom and somebody will say, this, this is our vision of the future and this is how it's going to look. And, and, and if you wait then and say, well, let's spend three months doing all the detail, etc cetera, etc cetera, then actually you 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 it's too late um and i think it's it's about having um an intelligence function that can go with the journey and say well maybe it looks like this and that would require this data but let's not sort of jump too early and let's use that as an iterative process there's a um there's a concept in in sort of forecasting around the cone of uncertainty you're probably all very familiar with it um and and the, the challenge is not to create a model that gives you a cone of uncertainty that's static, but to build a, a, a cone of uncertainty that's wrapped around by a cyclical process that gradually tightens the code, cone as you move. And if that's a visual sort of um, way of, of sort of thinking about how it could work, but that is a very different way of thinking um, because many will, will turn to um, you know, a, specific, a tightly specified data-driven um, rather than data enabled, um, quotes unquote model um, that is, as I said right at the start, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps instead of thinking about the wider system. Okay, thanks, Peter. I'm going to I'm going to move us on to, to David now, but I might um, just to warn you, I might come back to you, Peter, at the end actually, because I'm really one of my interests is just trying to link all this stuff together. So. We're going to hear about education data now, which is yeah, really interesting. Right. We've, yeah. we've done work previously with police data. You know, from working with Abraham, we're very interested in data about yeah. housing and demographics. And I'm I'm keen to to figure out how we can at least visualise all of that if it's possible. So, um, David, over to you. We've got 20 minutes or so uh, presentation. I'll I'll sort of manage some questions in the chat for you as well. But thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Over to you. Absolutely fine. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Um, so uh, my, my name is David Williams and uh, I'm Director of Inclusion for a, a chain of academies. Uh, we've got uh, everything from nurseries up to post 16. So uh, we, we do the whole whole age range. Uh, we've got specialist provision and we've got mainstream as well. Um, so in terms of specialist provision, we've got a specialist unit for um, severely deaf and we've got a, a unit for autistic children and another one for complex needs which is a basically a catch-all in education terms. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about really is well-being data. Um, back in about 2011-ish I did a I ran a longitudinal study uh, for a project I did for Oxford University uh, where we looked at whether or not educational data uh, was impacted by well-being data or the well-being of young people. Uh, and back then I, I got in um, contact with, with a company called Anspear, uh, who've got a, a tool called Pupil Perceptions. Uh, and it, it it's developed quite a lot since then, but that, that's what I want to take you through because in recent years, I've been quite aware that actually which we don't really then share um, in, unless the child's at the point of going into kind of a child protection case or being taken into into care we don't really share it with either social services or the nhs uh, and actually some of this data might be quite useful um for, as you'll see in a moment uh, could you go to the next slide please so um traditionally schools supported students in using a pastoral system so heads of years and school counsellors and so on and so forth you've all you've all been to school you've all experienced this um but it normally it was at the point of crisis or it was a based on a kind of subjective gut feeling from a member of staff who knows the child well um but there was kind of a, a, an understanding that well-being has an impact on attainment but very very few empirical studies i think there was only one or two empirical studies worldwide prior to about 2007 um, and even now, it, you, you're talking about a, a small handful of studies. Um, in terms of well-being, the part of the problem is is defining what is. And we're we talking about complex mental health, or we're talking about how much happy a child is in their life. And if you're talking about happiness, how do you how do you quantify happiness? Because it changes sometimes 
within an hour, let alone within a day or a year or so on and so forth. Um, so for that purpose, what, what I quite liked about Anne Spears' survey is that they, they basically um, look at the life of a child, so the physical health, the social interactions, the economic prosperity, um, emotional, mental state, um, and, and they come up with a, an aggregated score, which uh, is called a readiness for learning score. Um, and it's a weighted score and it's between zero and five uh, and a child with a score of zero would be a child that you'd be referring to <clears throat> probably first tier cans um, and a child with a score of five would would be very jolly and happy happily living their life um, i think the national mean is about three two and a half three something like that um and what 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 was interesting from my 2011-2012 longitudinal study, uh, and it was only with um, a thousand students, so, so statistically it is it is what it is, um, but what it showed empirically uh, and without any question was that for the pupils with the lowest levels of well-being, so the pupils who were scoring less than about 0.8, they were not achieving academically at all, uh, and, and you'd expect that really because what that's saying is, is that if the child is so worried about something going on in their home life or their physical health or somebody else's physical health, that they're not in a position to actually learn academically in the classroom, uh, which we kind of all knew, but, but there's no empirical data to prove it previously. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm gonna give you um, a bit of a look at some of the data that, that we use and that we hold. Um, this survey is held, sorry, the slide's not changed. Oh, yeah, there we go. This survey is, is run, um, I think there's about half a million students doing this um, across the country. So it's a reasonable size data set. It's not a huge data set, but it is a reasonable size. Um, what, what you've got here, this is the individual student profile. And, and what you can see is the category headings. So these aren't individual questions. These are kind of come from five or six questions that a student will do in an online survey. Uh, so behind that, I have a healthy lifestyle. They might have answered five or six questions to lead to that answer. Behind that, I feel healthy the same again, and so on and so forth. So there's about 100, 150, 160 questions in total. But what you can see is uh, very easy to read, positive, OK, negative, colour coding. And then up in the top right hand corner, the readiness for learning score that I was talking about, which is between zero and five, um, the school average and the national average. OK, if you go to the next slide for me. The bottom of this page, and it, it comes out as a PDF document for every single pupil, um, is a matrices. And this is really, really useful because what this does is this allows us to look at the different areas in a pupil's life, how that pupil feels about that area, and how that pupil views the people in their life's impact on that area. So we can see, and this, is a, uh, this example is predominantly green, but some of them may have lots of areas of orange potentially in family or friends, or the police or health professionals or teaching staff. But what you can see here is a pupil's view as to whether or not they feel that the police help to keep them healthy or health professionals help to keep them safe or teachers would help them stick to the rules or treat others with respect. And this is it's obviously only a snapshot from a point in time, but this is for an individual pupil. Um, and I'll talk a bit more in a moment, but we do this once a year with all of our pupils in the trust. And what that means is that we can track an individual child's view of their own well-being and their view of their interactions with health professionals, police, teachers, friends, family, et cetera, et cetera, over time. So we can use that readiness for learning score to see improvements or, or um, decreases in improvement um, over time. OK, next slide. Thank you. So the next slide uh, is a, a very tiny caption snapshot of a whole spreadsheet which you get per school. Um, by the way, this is all mock data. This is pretend data. Um, and what you've got is the respondent number. 
So the school would know the names of the pupils, um, but Anspear, the, the company, they, they only know an individual number, so it's anonymized from that point of view. Um, the Redness for Learning score next to the pupil, and then a color coding for the different categories. So being healthy, staying safe, enjoying and achieving, making positive contribution and economic well-being. I mean, it's roughly based on the old Every Child Matters agenda from probably the late, I suppose, 2008, 2009 ish. Um, and actually, it was one of the pieces of DfE legislation that schools in general, my experience is schools really liked, but it, it was dropped in um, when the current government came into power. Um, but I think there's still a lot of use behind looking at, at areas by category rather than just looking at an aggregate score. Um, OK, next slide, thank you. Moving on, we uh, within this is a, a snapshot from the right hand side of the spreadsheet, uh, and it, this is just one part of it. But what you can see here is by category. So the top section is by being healthy and the bottom section is staying safe. Um, the people, the following people helped keep me healthy. Uh, if I had a problem, I would feel happy to talk to. And you can see there who that child would be happy to talk to, who that child feels keeps them healthy. The following people keep me safe, who that child feels keeps them safe, who that child feels they could go to if they were being bullied or if they felt unsafe. And this is really useful because even within our trust, the different parts of our community have very different answers, um, particularly with the police, um, but, but also with health professionals and, and other professionals, social workers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can see based on uh, deprivation index, uh, that actually changes depending on which, which areas we're looking at. Uh, and I think this could be uh, possibly quite useful for the NHS uh, as almost pupil perception data uh, around health professional services. OK, thank you. Next slide. There we go. Um, we also get uh, whole reports uh, per school, and this doesn't have to be per school. This report can be run for an academy trust. It can be run for a number of schools. It could be run for a region. Um, it could be run for the whole country. Uh, the large bar in this example is for a secondary school and the small bar is for the national average. Um, it could be for a secondary school against the previous year. It could be the national average against the previous year. The, the data can be run any which way. What's really useful about this is that it breaks it down by all the different groups. So I've just given the examples here of gender, religion, year groups, so age uh, and ethnicity. Um, but it gives us the breakdowns for each question by each um, social segregation group, if you like. OK, next slide. Um, this is an example of uh, a question for feeling stressed or worried. And as you can see, um, that, that was an issue uh, in this data set, which was taken middle of COVID, I believe. <laughs> OK, next slide. And sexually healthy. Next slide. And, and I've only given you a few examples, but there are 150 odd questions. Um, so it's everything from understanding the dangers of legal drugs to feeling safe in the community, to feeling that there's things to do around their house, to um, a huge, huge number of different questions. Um, so this is my final slide really, and it's more of a list of questions, but I'm aware that we certainly hold this in our trust and, and other schools do. It's a very easy survey to run. Uh, it takes the pupils about 20 minutes. Um, and in schools, it's a very e we, we have them as a captive audience. If we want to get data, it's an incredibly easy thing to do. We, we put them in a computer room in, this, in registration and they do the survey and there's no ifs or buts or questions that if we can survey a thousand pupils in about a week quite easily. Um, the other thing that I, I have noticed from this data, and I, I've run it um, in a number of schools across West Oxfordshire and across Swindon now. So we're up to, I think I've, I've been involved in about 20 different secondary schools running it now. Um, and the feedback from the schools is overwhelmingly that the pupils tell the truth to computers. 
um, bizarrely, they don't lie to computers. They, they lie if, if adults sit them down and ask them questions, but when they're filling an online, on, an online form, that they, they answer pretty accurately. Uh, and what the schools are reporting is that they can predict probably 80% of the children who have got very low readiness for learning scores. Um, but the 20% that they wouldn't have predicted, when they go and talk to them, they're the ones who are parents and alcoholic and the school wasn't aware or somebody's dying in their family and the school wasn't aware. They're the ones that, that are hidden. Um, and it, and it, it does identify those in a way that schools have never been able to do before. Um, so my questions really are, um, would it be useful for education to be sharing some of this sort of data um, for NHS trusts um, or even NHS trusts to be asking us to collect it? Because it's probably a lot easier for us to be collecting people voice as it were, than it is to be trying to get GP surgeries to do it as they walk out on the way to the shops. Um, could tools like perceptions not only support student education, but also act as part of early identification for mental health provision? Um, so could we be linking up to offer early interventions and reduce numbers of children hitting crisis point? Because if we've got a well-being score for, I don't know, a year, a year seven child who's scoring 2.5 and then in year eight they score 1.8 and in year nine they score 0.8 we can predict from that trend that they are very very likely to be hitting the the cams teams in the next two years um, and it, it might actually work out better for the child and and more economical to, to be putting some kind of intervention or flagging it to the nhs early um, how could healthcare education data be linked to paint a picture, a full picture of the young person's life, really? Um, and then right at the end, I've, I've put down, um, I, I don't know how many of you are aware, but there's an education green paper out at the moment called uh, Send Review, the right support, the right place, the right time. Uh, it came out uh, right at the end of March. And it's a new single national send and AP, so alternative provision system proposal basically um, and what's interesting is that for the first time it, the, the aim is for it to be across education health and care um, and they're looking at a statutory national standards on how needs are identified recorded and met so decisions are basically taken on a child's needs rather than where they live um, at the moment it's very much postcode dependent um, I, I'm sure you have the same similar issues in, in the health service, um, but education is very definitely postcode dependent uh, and it's trying to break through that by working, by getting NHS, social care and, and education to, to put this one system together. Any questions, I suppose? It's a bit of a whistle yeah. stop tour. <laughs> really, really helpful, David. Really interesting. I've I've got three, um, but, I, but and they're not all for you. Um, and then I'll wait for others to come in. So a question for you. And we've also, we've got some really good people on this call because they've been sort of in the chat. So Alex Kafetz is on. And I was going to ask him and you the same question, which is, I mean, the end game to this is that you've got some nice people like you and me and Paul and Peter and Alex and others who think there may be something good to come of linking some data together. And that's the spirit yep. of Open Data Those Lives. So we did that around domestic abuse. We said, the police have got a file of women who... <laughs> thump women and the NHS have got a file of women who get thumped by men and we're good people and if we put those together we'll try and do some good things but we but we operate in a in a national context of people being quite nervous about data and having you know a history of things like care.data and gpgdr mm -hmm. haven't gone fantastically so it's sort of a so there's a question for you and, and I, I would take Alex's advice who's been working in this area for years and because it takes you into you know, should private industry be allowed to get access to data? Uh, it does, it's not always just the public sector that's working altruistically. There's plenty of people in industry and third mm -hmm. sector that are working altruistically. How mm -hmm. we challenge that. Uh, maybe I'll list that all questions. So that's the first one. The second one, we've got Nigel on from the Mental Health Trust. You make quite a strong challenge, mm -hmm. which is if you can predict someone going to go into CAMS, the, one of the Caldicott principles is the risk of not sharing data is worse sometimes than the risk of sharing data. So if you're super confident that you can find the mental health trust a, a client in a couple of years, kind of why wouldn't we do that? And the, the governance around that that we struggle with locally is direct care. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. you're a GP and I'm a patient 
and you can use everyone's data for direct purposes that's everyone's agreed that that's fine you know because if i'm unconscious in ed you can check with the gp record if i'm allergic to mm -hmm. penicillin and everyone agrees that that's groovy the secondary use of data as it's called is putting data together about me and you and data from the police and the academy yeah. and so it's sort of secondary use and that's when it becomes more difficult and and i i wonder in that in that example of your identifying early mental health provision you could look at that as secondary use of data because you're going off and getting some education data linking it some, but actually i wonder if you we might start to describe some of this as direct care do you sort of, it's quite yeah. It's quite it, it depends at what point it becomes direct care, doesn't it, really, to answer that? I'll, I'll take the second question first. Um, okay. I mean, if we're predicting very early, it's obviously less and less accurate. The closer you get to the point of crisis, the more accurate the data becomes and probably yeah. the, the, the more it becomes direct care. <laughs> yeah, but why, why would you wait would be the challenge. Correct. Yeah. And that's my um, question. <laughs> which is the same with domestic abuse. You, it's very, very sensitive to, to go to a family and say, we think this might happen. Yes. Um, but it's it's very interesting intellectually in law where what you're allowed to do. So in the in domestic mm -hmm. abuse example, the police were allowed in law to prevent crime. And they took that as their legal cover for linking um, their mm. data with data from the NHS and some people disagree with that and, and kind mm. of respect each people's opinion um, but I I think that's interesting Alex would you would you have a comment or view I, I know you made a point a while ago when we were talking about you know it's not it, that there's plenty of people in industry that are you know linking data at, at currently you know there's big central contracts mm -hmm. like Palantir and um, you know big consultancies and all sorts of people you know and they they would all say you know we've been commissioned centrally we're doing altruistic work and so on um i just wondered alex if you're there what your view was on on whether you can link you know data we, we've we've got experience of linking data about health but if you bring in education data policing data to david's point you're giving quite a rounded picture of a young person's health which is a good thing if done well i think Hi Mark, hi everyone. I'm afraid I've got COVID, so I'm not going to turn my camera on because I, I think I look quite rubbish. But uh, um, I, I think it's a yeah, I think it's a great question, and I think I, I totally agree with what you say. I think it, it's we we shouldn't have these kind of boundaries, at, you know, with the trusted research environments and with the kind of data lakes. You can you can put the data in there, and then you can have what I would call reputable organisations, be they public sector private sector third sector that that can make the case that that they are the best people to best people to do the to do the analysis so um i was involved in a campaign ages ago which failed with the coalition government that was trying to link national insurance number to nhs number because that would have given us that would have really pushed the inequalities debate forward. You can use, obviously you can use income tax as a proxy for um, uh, income, for example, and, and assuming everyone pays the taxes. And so that would have really pushed the inequalities debate forward. You could, you could look at earnings and that was a private members bill that kind of fizzled out when the coalition fizzled out. But I think, as you said, Mark, organizations like, like Palantir, despite their reputation have done some fantastic stuff during the pandemic and in, including for people that don't know the micromanagement of the cold store Pfizer a vaccine so so they knew that that you know Thursdays you need more you did you did more in the church and and Fridays you did more in the mosque or, or or whatever it was and they had all all the kind of really really micro data which meant that the mm -hmm. Pfizer wastage stats were were very very small and you know I don't have any links to them personally but but I think we just have to let the best people be able to do this and and the other thing which I think <laughs> less of a problem now is is the private sector is often happy to take the risk in terms of infrastructure and in in terms of you know sometimes they have the fastest computers and and so if, if they have got the fastest computers and they can do the kind of quantum computing and that's not something that can be afforded by a, a public sector organization or a university and again I've had that problem myself we we, we should kind of let them in to be able to do it yeah really helpful Alex I'm sorry I didn't mean to put you on the spot <laughs> it's, it's fine, fine. Um, thank you though um, 
Peter, do you want to come in at all on how you might draw d different sets of data together for the, some of the work that you're trying to do? And, and this would be a good example of one, I would have thought. So I think for me, it, it, it's sort of trying to um, mine the questions, if you like, for which the data is going to be used. Um, and I mean, you've, you've highlighted a, a key opportunity. And sometimes it's the data that stimulates the question. Uh, I'm quite happy with that. It's a sort of messy environment in which what's possible can then spark ideas about thinking more systemically. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the very fact that there's that sort of prevention agenda, you're you, you st stated quite stark that you go into a family and say, we think you're at risk of domestic violence. I think, don't think you would do that. I think you might go in and say, we might think, you know, we could work with you to improve your, your general health and well-being without sort of, sort of saying, otherwise you're going to end up in, uh, in dire mm -hmm. straits. So, and it's just getting that, that balance. Um, yeah, but, but in your anything, example... Yeah, anything that can help in that process to conceptualise the system is great. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I was thinking yeah. ahead to the intervention. So I, I was at a dinner yeah. last night with some GPs and there's, yeah. there's a guy from Imperial called Matt Harris, who's a, a sort of academic epidemiologist who's done some work in Brazil around community... I can't remember what they call them, community practitioners, but the, someone yeah. from a community... Um, is allocated at you know 150 households in, and they and it's there's a proven evaluation that by just checking in in a very non-confrontational way um, that <clears throat> you and you can start to see quite good outcomes and they've now yeah. done it in Westminster they've put three of yeah. them in and they're putting think, some um, sort of council estate by council estate yeah um, and that think, would be the intervention <clears throat> to your point where you're you're just checking yeah. in and seeing if everyone's okay yeah, exactly yeah and, and knowing where those hotspots are. Nick Garrett, who's on the call, one of my colleagues, is probably better qualified to answer that, both in terms of information mm -hmm. and sort of local connectedness. In, uh, our experience during COVID was also to have established a local community support organisation. So working at the very ground level, as well as on yeah. the top, and there risks there around you know, the enduring mental health needs of people during COVID that may still be under the surface, but could be could be identified and target is, isn't quite the right word, just protected against. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether Nick's got any comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think just, just quickly, the, there's two different things that I'm talking about. One of them I think is fairly straightforward, which is um, using pupil voice from education to, to support the NHS uh, with, with understanding views of, of health services because that's relatively easy it can be anonymized to um, either community area or it could be anonymized to lar larger scale than that it could it doesn't it could even be to NHS trust couldn't it um, so I can't see there being huge problems from that point of view from a GDPR point, um, perspective I think in terms of us referring or having a mechanism to, if we're concerned about pupils, pass that into the NHS. We already do that to, to some extent for children with education, health and care plans. Um, we, parent, the, you get into parental responsibility as being um, part of the issue. So if the child's over 13, we, we're allowed to um, contact doctors and GPs directly without parental permission. If they're under 13, we're supposed to go to the parents first. Um, so I think we need to have a look at that um, from, from schools' points of view. Um, I think the other question really is, is would it be useful um, in the light of this green paper that, that is obviously aiming to bring education, health and social care together? And I know that's been said many, many times in the past. Um, would it be useful for us to be collecting data for, for the NHS? Because it's, it's an awful lot easier for us to do it than you. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah. Can I, can I jump in there? It's Nick Garrett here from mm. Whole Systems Partnership. Thanks, Matt. Um, yes, it just, it's not just useful to the NHS. I mean, it is also useful to, um, um, dare I say, local government, where schools used to be. Mm. Do you routinely share this with your local authorities? No. No. And that, you see, that's an absolute tragedy in my eyes. I mean, it, yeah. and, and it, it, I, I wouldn't say it's a disgrace, but it's a tragedy. And, mm. and because, you know, youth services, pupil voice, all hosted and commissioned mm. by local authorities, trying to plan how much you need to do further down the track, really understanding yeah. what the needs of kids going through transitions are. You know, this is vital stuff yeah. that used to be held within the local government family that has been lost because it's been 
in academized and the system is losing out big time and, and children lose out because this isn't shared so i mean before you start talking about nhs you should really be thinking about you know, where this where this used to be and who used to hold this information and yeah it wasn't done perhaps brilliantly or particularly greatly by local authorities but they will bite your hand off for this data they will literally be screaming yeah. at you saying give us it give us it give us it because it's what's needed uh, and also within the, you know, it's also helpful for the strategic planning piece as well. So, for instance, a local authority will have, will have teams dealing with antisocial behaviour and the have youth services. And they'll want to handle that in a really sensitive way. And having this type of data really helps them have better conversations with the police, which means it stops police rocking up at your school and asking awkward questions because they're better prepared. So really that that piece where... You know, it's shared on 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 the web, whether that's your own website or or it's or it's it, it's a local authority one or somewhere or you know ODI used to you know do this really really brilliantly, um, you know so police so other agencies can just dip into it and use it would be phenomenal. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't think of it just as a point relate point relationship with the NHS or a point relationship with local government having it somewhere where they can all access it and then you can then start leading the conversation with those agencies to really help you the academy trust in, in its objectives and it will it will bring people together much more so really support what you're doing i think it's really great the other thing i would note is if you're a looked after child um you've probably been asked those questions five times by five different agencies yeah it's not great yeah. so if you're no, a looked after child absolutely. you've been asked that by local authority social care probably by the youth service that you're interacting with and your school have asked you all that information as well. And so there's a bit of sensitivity around certain cohorts of children and young people that needs to be taken into account there. Because yeah. my, my experience... Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. Um, and, and particularly for children in care, because of the turnover of social workers, they're often being asked 15, 20 times because they're having so many social workers, sometimes three, four different in a year. Yeah. Um, one of the beauties of doing the survey in this way is that you survey all the pupils together so you're not making any individual child stand out um where well, what i we've used things like strengths and difficulties questionnaires before um with, with children who are, who are at crisis point and then they do feel like they're being taken out of a lesson and being asked but actually when when you do it with whole cohorts it that sort of combats that problem a little bit um so yeah I completely take your point on that that's great. And, and, and just, just to per, uh, kind of play out that probably understanding insecure children who live in insecure housing, bed and breakfast and hostels, probably a yeah. good one. And, and if you yeah. start to share this with local authorities, they're probably going to want to understand that in more detail. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're doing some analogous work around homelessness at the moment, and it's much more complicated to record and count than you might assume because it's not all about no fixed abode um, I'm conscious we're over time I always try and give people time back and I've failed miserably um, I'm really grateful for everyone dialing in we will publish all of this uh, we'll put a blog together we'll summarize it um, we will definitely build something out uh, with David's data Nick and we'll get you involved in that because you've, you've clearly got a strong interest in it so um, thanks everyone for dialing in there's in the chat there is a link to the next session but we'll We'll contact you the usual ways as well. So thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.